Good evening. Let's turn in our hymnals to 531 together. 531. All hail the power of Jesus' name. Let angels prostrate fall. Oh. Take your Bible if you would. Let's go to Matthew 28. Matthew chapter 28. Matthew 28, we're going to, I'm going to read to you the last few verses, beginning with verse number 16. Matthew 28, verse 16, the Bible says, And the eleven disciples went away into Galilee, into a mountain where Jesus had appointed them. And when they saw Him, they worshipped Him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. Father, add your blessing to the reading of our scripture tonight and others that we'll turn to and look at this evening. And then, Father, as we look at the commission that you gave to the disciples, and yea, that you've given to each one of us. I pray, Lord, that you would open our understanding tonight, and and Lord, speak to us about fulfilling this commission, and what our part should be in carrying out this commission. And so, Lord, have your way in each one of our hearts and lives, please. Help me as I bring the message, and help each individual say, listen tonight. And may your will be accomplished in each of our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. The commission, of course, we know it uh, a little more familiar to us as the Great Commission. Uh, It is not contained in just one place. Uh, It's not... All of it is not given any one of the Gospels. It is in all, all of the Gospels, and it's in the first chapter of the book of Acts as well. Um, to get it in its entirety, you take all of those mentions together, and you because each mention gives a different aspect or emphasizes a different aspect of what we know as the Great Commission. But what all of them agree is this. It's our responsibility to carry the gospel of Christ to all men everywhere while we wait for His return. We don't uh, go up in a mountain and, you know, hide out until Jesus comes. Uh, The Bible says we're to occupy until He comes. Occupy is the root we get our word occupation from. Well, what's our business? What's our occupation? Our occupation is to go and preach the gospel to every creature. We're to go and to teach all nations and baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost and to teach them to observe all things whatsoever I've commanded you. So there's the commission. And it's rightfully said, as we mentioned the other night, if we stopped all the deaths and we stopped all the births tonight and from this point on, nobody would be born and no one would die and we kept winning people to Christ at the same rate we're winning people to Christ now, it would take us over 3,000 years to win the rest of the world to Christ. So why is that? Because so few Christians are witnessing and winning anyone to Christ. We, the great commission has become the great omission. Oh me. Gets quiet in here, doesn't it? Let's talk about the commission tonight that the disciples got and that you and I have as well. Number one is the prerequisite. The prerequisite in the commission. Jesus said in verse 16, Then the eleven went away into Galilee, into a mountain where Jesus had appointed them. Did you notice that? The first prerequisite is obedience. Obedience. Had the disciples not gone to the appointed place, then they would not have been they would not have been able to receive the commission. They had to fulfill that appointment before they were going to get another. Do you understand? In Matthew twenty eight, if you notice, and and when the angel tells the, the women he is not here in verse six, he is risen as he said, Come see the place where the Lord lay. 
Verse 7, And go quickly and tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead. And behold, he goeth before you into Galilee. There shall ye see him. Lo, I have told you. And here, verse 16, they went away into Galilee, into a mountain where Jesus had appointed them. Evidently, Jesus had told them when he would rise from the dead, there was an appointed place for them to meet him. And they had to obey and go there and meet him there. You see, hold your finger there in Matthew 28 and go back to an Old Testament book of 1 Kings. 1 Kings 17. 1 Kings 17. We come on in 1 Kings 17, there's a man who comes on the scene named Elijah. Elijah comes on the scene and has God's prophet to go against Ahab, the wicked king of Israel. And Elijah, verse 1, the Tishbite, who was an inhabitant of Gilead, said unto Ahab, As the Lord God of Israel liveth, before whom I stand, there shall not be dew nor rain these years, but according to my word. And the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, Get thee hence, and turn thee eastward, and hide thyself by the brook Cherith, or Cherith, and that is before Jordan. And it shall be that thou shalt drink of the brook, and I have commanded the ravens to feed thee, what's the last word? There. Where was there for Elijah? It was at that brook. And it was there that the ravens came and fed him, and he drank of the water of the brook. And then as the famine increased, or the, the, the uh, dearth, no, no rain, the brook begins to dry up. And if you read a little further on, the word of the Lord, verse 8, came to him, saying, Arise, get thee to Zarephath, which belongeth to Zidon, and dwell there. Behold, I have commanded a widow woman there to sustain thee. Notice, go to Zidon, and dwell there. And behold, I have commanded a widow woman there to sustain thee. He would have never got to that there if he never went to the first there. You understand? Uh, he has to obey. Before, before you're giving, giving higher responsibilities, you fulfill the lower responsibilities. Before you're giving more responsibility, you have to be fulfilled the lesser responsibility. Jesus said, He that is faithful in that which is least is faithful also in that which is much. You have to establish the fact that you'll be obedient in that which is little. God is not in the habit of employing people in His vineyard who have not been faithful in their previous tasks. Faithfulness determines usefulness. So be faithful where God has placed you. God is watching your faithfulness whether anyone else sees it or not. God is looking for faithfulness. So that's the obedience in the prerequisite. The second thing, back in Matthew 28, the second prerequisite that I see is this matter of devotion. Devotion. In verse 17, it says, When they saw Him, they worshipped Him. They worshipped Him. Worship uh, shows their devotion they had for Jesus Christ. Those who are devoted to Christ will never sit on the sidelines and do nothing. Paul in 2 Corinthians 5.14 said, It's the love of Christ that constraineth us. It's the love of Christ that, that motivates me to do something for God. And motivates me to reach the lost with the gospel. And it's your love for Jesus Christ. When Hudson Taylor was recruiting men and women to go to China as missionaries and they said they uh, he said I'm looking for men and women to go to China and they said you want men and women that love the souls of the Chinese people and he said no and they were somewhat taken back that he said they don't need to love the souls of the Chinese people he said I'm looking for people who have a love for Jesus Christ for if they have a love for Jesus Christ then certainly they'll love the souls of the Chinese people it's a devotion to the Lord Jesus Christ. When Peter, Jesus appeared to Peter after Peter had denied him, and he appears to him that morning when they were fishing and they had fished all night and caught nothing, and Jesus 
uh, they recognized it was Jesus on the shore. And remember, he had fish frying. And before he ever said, Simon, uh, feed my sheep, he said, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me more than these? You see, he had to find out how much do you love me? How much are you devoted to me? You see, it has to do with devotion. The church at Ephesus was a great church. And it's commended many great things said about the church at Ephesus until you get in the book of Revelation, in Revelation chapter 3, and it says, I have somewhat against you because you have left your first love. And then he commands them to repent and return to that first work. The very first and greatest commandment is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, all your strength. That's the very first and greatest commandment. Everything we do is ought to be done out of a love for Jesus Christ. Out of our love for God. Out of our devotion to Him. And so, it, there's, there's two prerequisites here in the commission, and that is, number one, obedience. But obedience stems from our devotion to the Lord Jesus. And, and by the way, you, you, have, you have both. I, uh, if, if you remember this, it will help you. There's, there's two rails that your service for Christ will run on. And they run parallel to each other, and they are, they are duty and devotion. Now there are times both will be present. Not only will you know what you should do and what you ought to do, but you'll have the feeling that goes with it. But there are times when you don't have the feeling. And you know what has to carry you then? Your duty. What you know is right to do. You ever, you ever, you ever not felt like reading your Bible? Yes? Say, you're kidding, preacher. Yeah? You know what you do? Your duty and your, your, your obedience says, I'm to read the Bible. You ever had times when you just, just couldn't wait to get to your Bible and open it and spend time with God? Yes. And you just look forward to that? That was, that was your devotion coming. That's wonderful. I think that's what Paul meant when he told Timothy, Timothy, you be instant. You be the same in season and out of season. You stay consistent. And to do that, see somebody says, why do they got to do it if I don't feel like doing it? Well, you don't live by your feelings. I think it was one of the old preachers that said, feelings come and feelings go and feelings are deceiving. My warrant is the Word of God, not else is worth believing. We live so much by our feelings. And America has become that way. We used to always, the question you used to always ask people is, what do you think about that? Now we don't ask that question anymore. You know what we ask? What do you feel about that? Or how does that make you feel? That's what, those are the questions we ask now. Because everybody wants to live off their feelings. Listen, sometimes when the feeling's there, you're, it's in season, praise God. But when it's out of season, you still do what you're supposed to do. Duty and devotion. Obedience and devotion. That's the prerequisites for the commission. Number two, <clears throat> number two, the passion in the commission. The passion in the commission. He said, go, verse 19, go ye therefore and teach all nations. The, the word is go. The first word is a word of action. There's no room for laziness here. There's no room for uh, not just sitting around and doing nothing. Go is a get up and get at it. Go is doing something. The, the great commission will never be carried out if there's not a passion to go. You have to go. The first two letters of the gospel are G-O. Okay? So we have to go. You go with the specific purpose in mind. I'm going to go and teach people how to know they're going to heaven. Okay? But you have to go. Most people never win anyone to Christ because they never intend to win anyone to Christ. They never set out to win anyone to Christ. I think, I think we ought to witness everywhere we go, any opportunities that God gives us. I think we ought to be prepared to witness. But I also think there ought to be some time during a week 
where that's what you, you set out to do. Get yourself some tracts, get yourself a New Testament, and say, I'm just going to go out. I'm going to go talk to people with the express purpose of trying to win someone to Jesus Christ. You say, well, Pastor, I just don't ever do that. How many do you lead to Christ? You see, you, you, you won't get what you don't set out to do. If it's the Great Commission, we don't set any side of time, aside any time out of our 168 hours, to do that. Think about it. Go. G-O. It's a word of action. So that's the passion in the commission. Number three, the person. The person's in the commission. Notice he said, Go ye therefore. Who's ye? Ye are those disciples that were gathered there. You'll find out in other passages, as, you, as we will look at them, there wasn't just the eleven that were there, but other followers as well that, that received this same commission. It's personal. Each disciple there on the mountain that day, each disciple that heard Jesus Christ, knew it was their responsibility to go. Every disciple is obligated to go. Every disciple is obligated to serve. Every disciple is obligated to carry out this commission. You can't throw it on someone else. You can't, you can't throw it on someone else and say, well, yeah, they, I'm glad they're going, or man, I'm going to pray that they'll get called. You have to say, Lord, listen, I'd not, I don't think, I think everybody's called. I think you have to be specifically told to stay put. I think everybody ought to be a missionary. Unless God tells you to stay home. Wow. Listen, that's why God will take volunteers. What did Isaiah say? Here am I, Lord. Send me. And what did God say? Okay. Let's go. He just volunteered. You know God takes volunteers? Don't ever hide behind, I'm not called. No, oh, you've been called. When he said, go ye, that means, that means you, that means me. Don't bow your head, it's not time to pray. Okay? All of us. We're to go with the gospel. Let You go and just let God tell you no. Remember what we said the other night? You never get in trouble when you tell God yes. You only get in trouble when you tell God no. No. You, you, you're like Brother Cleghorn, you know, well, God, I, Jesus, you're, you're allowed in the guest room, but you can't go into that innermost room in my heart. That's, that, that's under lock and key. That's, that's for me to be in. That's what I want. Not, not, not for you. But he wants the key to the rooms of every room in your heart. And he's to be the Lord of all. So that's the persons in the commission. Ye applies to all of us. Number four, the preaching in the commission. Go ye therefore and teach all nations. Now this teach, there's two words teach here in verse 19. And then verse 20 says teaching them to observe all things. There's two different words there used for the word teach. The first teach is a word from which we get our word disciple. It's a verb form of the word disciple. That's why your people say, go and make disciples. And that's where that comes from. Go and teach all nations. And we're teaching them about salvation. It involves salvation. And if it involves salvation, then it involves a Savior. And we know from the other accounts in Mark, go ye therefore and preach the gospel to every creature. Go ye therefore into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature, is how Mark had it written. And so it involves salvation, it involves a Savior, it involves one becoming a follower of Jesus Christ, because that's a disciple. You and I, going out, proclaiming Jesus Christ to men and women, that He's the Savior they need, seeing them receive Christ as their Savior, 
obey Him in baptism, and then be willing to be a follower of Jesus Christ. Now, that kind of Christianity the world looks down on. They call that proselytizing. But proselytizing is when you're converting someone from one religion to another religion. We're not proselytizing. We're not getting someone from one religion to another religion. We're taking them from a religion to being a follower of Jesus Christ. It's a person. It's not a religion. It's not a set of rules and ceremonies. That's why, that's why we, we don't... Listen, that's making, getting people to be disciples, that's why we do not, we do not just go get decisions We're going to make disciples. Now it begins with a decision. You have to make a decision whether you'll trust Jesus Christ or not. So it begins with that, but it doesn't end with that. It starts with that, but it doesn't end with that. So the preaching, and we go out to preach Jesus Christ. We preach the gospel, Mark said. When we preach the gospel, the gospel is the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Don't go out and and Satan will have you get sidetracked on all sorts of things. You'll you'll want to witness someone and tell them about Christ and how they can know they're on the way to heaven and they want to know all sorts of things. All of a sudden they're very concerned about the heathen in the world who've never heard of Jesus. What happens to them? They never gave thought to the heathen before that moment. But they're concerned about him now. Are they concerned about where uh, Cain got his wife after all anyway? And I ask all kinds of questions to get you off the gospel. I was witnessing to uh, a lady one time and she stopped middle of my witnessing. She goes, are you one of those Baptists that, believe, that don't believe in dancing? So I had to... You know, now, okay, do I talk, tell her I'm a dancing Baptist or do I tell her I'm a, what do I do with it? You know, I just, and you know what you learn to say? You say, hey, that's a, that's a good question. I'll be happy to talk with you about that as soon as I'm done sharing with you what I came to talk with you about. And you go right back to the gospel. You know what I found out? 99% of the time, once you get through the gospel, and especially if they receive Christ as their Savior, they don't care where King got his wife. They don't care about the heathen in Africa. They're just glad they got saved. And they know Jesus Christ. See, that was just a diversionary attack. Don't get off the track. God, He never said, go into all the world and preach your convictions. I never go into someone's house, and if they're smoking a cigarette, I don't say, can you put that dirty, rotten, stinking, filthy thing out? You know why? It's their house. They can do what they want. The television on, I don't say, man, what are you watching that idiot box for? Huh? I don't say those things. Now, I say, listen, uh, if it's loud, and sometimes it is, I'll say, hey, is this your favorite program, or can we turn that down a little bit? And most of the time, they'll say, oh, no, I'm not watching it, and they'll shut it off. But, but you, you know, don't get off the subject. Don't get off what we're there to do, and that's to preach the gospel. That's the preaching in the Great Commission. We're preaching Jesus Christ. We're teaching them how to know Christ as their Savior. Most people don't know how to simply, they don't know what the Bible says about going to heaven. If you ask most people, if you learn to ask this question, has anyone ever taken a Bible and showed you from the Bible how you can know 100% sure that when you die you'll go to heaven? You know what the answer most people will tell you? No. No one's ever done that. Could I take a few moments and show you from the Bible how God says that we can have His assurance that when we die, we'll go to heaven? Would that be all right? And most people will say, sure. Okay? So, keep on the gospel. That's the preaching and the commission. Let's go to number five. Number five is the place of the commission. The place of the commission. Go ye therefore and teach all nations. The word is ethnos, which literally means ethnic groups. 
I remember several years ago when I was in India for the pastor's conference there at the South India Baptist Bible College, I think among the pastors that were there, Brother Moreland and the student body of the college there, I think there were 185 different ethnic groups represented just in that one meeting in India. That's what he's talking about. Not just the nations that there's, I'm not sure, 220-some nations in the world, but every single ethnicity, every single group needs to hear the gospel. In other words, fellas, disciples, the gospel is not limited to the Jews. It's not limited to the Galileans. It's not limited to the Americans. Okay? The gospel is for everyone to hear. What did Mark remind us of? Carry the gospel to every creature. <coughs> Everybody ought to know who Jesus is. Every creature preaching the gospel. And what an opportunity with the technology that's available to us now to, to, to reach men and women and to teach them with the gospel when you don't have to even travel there. By way of the internet and by way of the technology we have, Brother Morland teaches these pastors in India now two times a week, and he does it with Skype. Forty men sometimes are sitting there listening, taking notes. As the fellow just holds up the, the iPad and shows it to all the guys sitting there. And he's sitting in his home in Ohio and speaking to men half a world away. It's an amazing thing. Teach all nations. Number six. Number six, the practice in the commission. Baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Here's the practice. Once they are taught how to know Christ as their Savior and they receive Him as their Savior, the first practice is baptism. Once they receive Christ, they ought to be baptized. And baptism is always by immersion in water. The word is, in the, in the Greek language, baptizo. And literally, if you ask a... Where's my Greek friend here? Is that correct? Baptizo? Sound or close? And if I said, what is a word that means to immerse? Would baptizo qualify for that? To plunge or to... Go under? Is that right? Candy's shaking her head. She knows. I should ask, I should ask her, shouldn't I? Okay. That's the brains of the outfit here, all right? And uh, <laughs> so that's a plunge or to immerse. It has but one meaning. It, does, it cannot mean another. Baptism is an outward profession of an inward act. It's an outward testimony that you believe in the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Baptism states where you stand and with whom you stand. You're baptized, you say, I believe that Jesus died, He was buried, and He rose again for me. You're letting everyone see that I believe in the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ for me. And we see outwardly what you have believed in your heart. That's baptism. So when it says baptizing them, them are those who've been taught the gospel. Those who have believed on Jesus Christ. Those who have believed in Christ and are following Him. The only ones baptized are believers in Jesus Christ. No one in the Bible got baptized without first believing. When Philip is talking to the eunuch riding along in the chariot, from, he's from Ethiopia, the eunuch was. You remember, as he opens up the Bible and the eunuch's reading Isaiah 53 and he doesn't understand it. And, and Philip says, do you understand what you're reading? He says, how can I except some man guide me? And the Bible says, Philip opened that same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. What do we preach him when we go out? We're preaching Jesus Christ. Well, the fellow uh, believed and he said, here's, here's some water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? 
Philip said, if thou believest with all thine heart. He said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. You see, for a Jewish man to admit that, he's saying, I believe he's the Messiah. He's my Savior. And so he stopped the chariot. They both went down into the water, both Philip and the eunuch. Why? Because baptism's by immersion. See, if I would be, I would assume going across the desert in the chariot, he would have had water in the chariot. But he didn't say, let's just sprinkle some of this canteen water on your head. You'll be okay. That's not baptism. That's getting water sprinkled on your head. It's always by immersion in the Bible. Every single time, and it's by those, it's always after you believe in Jesus Christ. Before, it has no significance, it has no meaning. First, you become a disciple, then you are baptized. Believing in Christ always comes before the baptism. So I got baptized before I believed. Then you went in a dry sinner and you came out a wet sinner. But that's all that happened. You just got wet. It wasn't baptism. Because baptism is for believers. Notice what it says then. Baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. That's the Trinity. You're acknowledging God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And notice what it said. Does it say baptizing them in the names of the Father? No, name. It's one name because it's one God. It's the Trinity taught in Matthew 28, verse number 19. It's just one name. It's not names. It's His name. What's His name? Father. What's His name? Son. What's His name? Holy Ghost. It's all the same name for God. Okay, so the first thing in the practice is baptism. The second thing is to teach. Notice verse 20. Teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. This is where the time and the effort takes place. Are you listening? This is where most Christians and most churches fail in the Great Commission. Right here. We only, we only like to count salvations and baptisms. God counts salvations, baptisms, and disciples. what it says teaching them to observe all things which I have commanded you those being taught to observe all things now that's difficult because it's hard to put that into a number it's hard to put those who are learning and those who are being taught to observe all things it's hard to put in numbers to it and we're very numbers oriented especially in American churches But it's a very important part of the Great Commission. And if we're not doing it, we're not fulfilling the Great Commission. We're not carrying out the Great Commission if all we do is see somebody saved and see them baptized and never teach them to observe all things whatsoever I've commanded you. Boy, that's quiet, isn't it? It's awful quiet. Again, notice who's being taught. Them. Those who believe and have been baptized. And again, why? Why is it that we lack so much in that area? Because that is hard work. That's effort. But many are deceived by false teachers and false cults and, 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 and taken into their number who we reached with the gospel. And maybe even saw them baptized, but never went back to teach them all things whatsoever I've commanded you. 
and we 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 give we see them give we see the spiritual birth and they're as the bible describes them newborn babes and we abandon them for whoever comes along next the mormons for years boasted that over 80% of their converts were former Baptists. They don't, they don't preach the gospel and win them to faith in Christ. They let us do that. Knowing that we'll leave them alone then and they can go in and pick them up. We are to teach them all things whatsoever I've commanded you. The emphasis there is on conduct. Let me, let me say this. I, I, I'm not opposed, and we have folks who are one-on-one -on -one discipling. I think we have 16 people right now that are being discipled one-on-one -on -one some point during the week. They have material that they're going through. And, but I think the best discipleship program is the local church. The best thing you can tell a one who gets saved and baptized is to say, you know what you need to do? Don't say, we'll see you next Sunday. Say, hey, come back to church Sunday night. And then tell them to come Wednesday night for Bible study. And then tell them to come to Sunday school for the Sunday school hour. And then tell them to be in church Sunday morning, and then Sunday night, and then Wednesday night. The, what I have observed through 36 years of pastoring is the ones who catch immediately the ones who are saved and baptized and catch immediately that I need to be faithful to church are the ones who grow and get grounded and begin to understand what God wants them to do with their life. And you know what happens? They begin to get taught what the Bible says and the first thing that affects is their conduct. They, they begin to understand God has a way He wants me to live. I no longer just live and do what I want, what I think and what I feel. God has a way for me to live. God is concerned about my conduct. We're to teach them how to behave. Jesus said, you are my friends if you do whatsoever I command you. There are commands in the Bible that Jesus gives us that affect the way we live. So He deals with our conduct, but He also deals with what we believe. That is our creed. You're going to teach them doctrine of the Bible. When, when the 3,000 were saved at Pentecost, these continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. That's Bible teaching and teaching them the doctrines. That was the, that's going to be the foundation of their faith because what you believe determines how you behave. Your creed determines your conduct. And so it involves both as we teach the new Christian. Then they understand what they're to believe and they understand how they're to behave. And it helps them to live for God. So that is the practice in the commission. That's where we fall so short. That is the effort and the work that goes into helping someone to be a follower of Jesus Christ. Number seven, the promise in the commission. The promise. The promise is, Lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. That's a wonderful promise. One, one old preacher said he never flew on an airplane because Jesus said, Lo, I am with you always. So he wouldn't fly. He said, He's not with me when I go up there, all right? But he is, amen? What a promise. Lo, I am with you always. That's the abiding presence of the Savior. You know, it's such a, 
It's such a comforting fact. You're not there on your own. He's with us. And remember what he said before they went out? Verse number 18, Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. The all-powerful one is with us. He is beside us and He's in us and He wants to work through us. I am. Who's I am? That's God. It's the deity of Jesus Christ. That's omnipotence. We have the omnipotence of God to go with us. We have not only that, I am with you always. Always. That's, that's His omnipresence. He will never leave us nor forsake us. Hey, when you go to talk to people, you got more than the salesman has. You got more than the, than the cosmetic person has that's trying to sell you cosmetics. No offense, ladies. You have the great I am with you. You have the omnipotent one with you. The all-powerful one with you. Say, so, oh, I think that person looks too hard. Is anything too hard for the Lord? No. And he's, he, there's never a situation you're in, but that He's there too. He's omnipresent. I'm with you always. We don't go alone to preach and to baptize and to teach. To serve Him successfully, we have to have His help. We have to have His help. Otherwise, we, we won't do the job. We'll, we'll succumb to our fears. Most Christians will never, they do not witness for Christ because of the number one reason fear. They're afraid. I can't be afraid if He's with me. I can't be afraid if He's right beside me. I can do, well, except witness. I can do, except preach the gospel. We, we all put our parentheses in there. But he said all things. All things. All things through Christ which strengtheneth me. So we have His power, and we have His presence, and we have His peace, and we have His purity. You know what I found out? Most children behave pretty good when mom and dad are around. You ever, you ever have children here from another room and you hear a little uh, escalation going on? And so you decide to check it out and you walk down the hall and you open the door and all of a sudden it's nice and quiet. And you say, everything okay in here? And they say, yeah, man, everything's great. All of a sudden everything's fine. Why? Because you're there. Hmm? You know, when you're aware of the abiding presence of Christ, you'll behave better. He's right there. He's right there but we lose the awareness that He's there. One of the greatest things you can ever do is continue to remind yourself, Lord, make me mindful of Your presence today. Make me mindful of Your presence today. Remind me that You're here so I don't forget. We behave better when we're aware Christ is around. We're, we, we just behave better when we know Christ is around. Let's obey the command of the commission, shall we? So many have never heard. Let's go, let's pray, and let's give. So the world, the whole world, can know about Jesus Christ. Let me encourage you, church family, be here every night for the conference. What an opportunity. You hear, you hear 
two messages Thursday, two on Friday, one on Saturday, three on Sunday. That's two, four, five, eight messages in four days. That's like, that's like a couple of weeks worth or a month's worth of church. Imagine what that will do for your soul. Imagine what God can do in your life. Just make it a priority. See what God will do. And then let's, let's make it the Great Commission again. Let's go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Let's stand together for prayer, shall we? Father, I pray you'll take the truth now this evening. And Lord, I pray that each of us would once again take the heart, your command, the word to go and to teach all nations, all ethnic groups. Everybody ought to know who Jesus is. And God, I pray that you'll stir our hearts in these days ahead through the missionaries that are coming and what you have done with them through the decades of their faithfulness to you. You'll ignite a passion in our heart like never before to have a part in getting the gospel to every creature. Lord, I pray that each of us would do what you prompt us to do. Help us to be faithful. Help us to do what we ought to do these next four days. And we'll thank you for it. Dismiss us now with your care and Lord, make us mindful of your presence as we leave this place tonight. It's in Jesus' name we ask it. Amen.